All right, if you would stand, everyone stand for this, this part of the presentation. That'll get the blood flowing back to your brain, hopefully. All right, remain standing if you have a car that's got 100,000 miles on it. Okay. Uh, anyone that's got 150,000 miles? Okay. Uh, 200,000. 200,000. God. Two, 220, do I hear 225? <laughs> two, all right. Two, no, he's not sure. Uh, 250. Okay. So it's somewhere between. Okay. So I'm going to. I wasn't like the guy juggling yesterday, but I think it's probably going to be a truck or a Toyota sedan or a Honda sedan. Am I right? Toyota, I knew it. Okay, so I've done this with with all all kinds of folks. Ty, okay, so there, see, was I right? A truck. Okay, let me ask you this: Do you know exactly the mileage? <laughs> see, he knows that. Al, what what is yours? You, what, how many miles is on your car? <laughs> so we're gonna talk. Uh, okay, so so it's an HGM type vehicle. It's been yes, okay, and yours. You said a Highlander, two twenty nine. Okay, all right. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What is your how, what? All right, come up here. You gotta come up here. All right, give her a hand. She's come on, come on. You're the next contestant. All right. So the Honda Fit. Okay, I was gonna say either Honda Corolla. All right. Uh, and you get to pick shameless prizes here. So we have this is. Do you want the red? Okay. You know what? Well, very good. And you know what? It's a, it's a it matches a car and it's also a, it's a it's a Corolla. Okay. So this and I get to keep this take this one home. Thank you so much. Okay. So and tell me your name again. Jennifer. Okay. So we talk about drivers of value, and that's really what we're trying to do with all this quality stuff here, is um, value is defined as quality, safety, service, and cost. And so with Al's, at some point, now, your car is going to cost more to maintain than it's worth, right? You're going to be putting more money in, and that value is not going to work out for you like it used to. You haven't hit that yet, though, right? You're still changing out the things, so it must be relatively simple changes. Okay, so all right, so in his case, service is so important, right? That's that's and the quality of the car once it's running, it's perfect, right? Okay, so so Jennifer, uh, I assume it's a high quality car. What year is it? Okay, and I've seen it. So people that have high mileage cars know exactly how many miles they have on it. Um, so let me ask you, Jennifer, would you want to use that car if it was unpredictable or unsafe? No, of course not. How about if you had to take it in the dealership all the time for, for just simple things? Probably not. Is it paid off? Yes. I assume that it was at this point. So the idea, so we talk about what's quality. It, there's a lot of misconceptions about what it is and what it isn't. I always maintain that quality promotes value, okay? And so when people ask, why are we doing all this ISO stuff and all this quality stuff? It's all about improving the value for our patients and our and our customers. And um, Actually, one of the other young ladies that helped set this up this morning, she knew right away who that was. He goes, oh, that's really cool. That's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I said, yeah, it's going to be that kind of presentation. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can get this to advance. If it doesn't freeze up on me, bear with me. Sometimes you have to kick it in the head a little bit and make it move. Let's go here. here. Uh -oh. Oh, I got that one. It's not letting me advance. And I don't want to stay back here all day. I hope I don't have to. There, yeah, I had to lock it up. Oh, oh, now we're back. We got the high tech. So, and it, this is this. I talked about this this morning. This idea of suppliers and customers. And as long as you've got that interchange between providers and patient, HTM staff, clinical staff, you've got this idea of value. And, and Lean Six Sigma, uh, other quality improvement tools, promote value. That's really what it's all about. And it's where supply meets demand. Um, a little bit about my journey. It was a long journey. Uh, and as I was telling Al, has anyone met someone that was so anti, and then when they get converted, they're like pro, like can't stand them? Anyone? What was that person? Or maybe it's you. What was what was the activity or the? It's probably rowdy. 
rounding. Okay, so they this person said rounding, no, but then they got they they got on board with it, right? Well, that was me with quality. So it was uh, crammed down our throats at GE. Um, I got my certification, took it to other companies, and along the way, I learned new ways to apply it and thought I knew everything there was to know about it, which is a false assumption. And until I uh, went down this path with an HTM in ISO. So I moved from being sort of a trainee to more of a master. And SSMI is a, is a company I've worked with, um, with their quality tools and uh, love their approach. Actually, Mike, Michael Harry was the, he co-created Six Sigma and um, the way they do it is the way it should be done in my humble opinion. So I'm actually that person who was really anti this and now I'm really pro because I really can see some of the benefits of it. So today we're gonna to talk about why your customers demand quality. It drives value, no pun intended, um, and some approaches. So Lean and Six Sigma, they're complementary tools that improve service quality and value. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about why uh, improvements often fail and some strategies to overcome that. There'll be a little, a little bit of overlap from the morning session. So those that were here this morning, bear with me. Uh, repetition's good, so you can really get it this time. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about a rapid cycle case study. And what rapid cycle really is, has anyone been through Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma training? Certification? You have. Okay, what, cert what certification at level are you? Yellow Belt, okay. So you can correct me, if I've got this down about where Yellow Belts fit into the universe. But it's really a lot of things, and so I'm trying to take the mystery out of out of this stuff because it's really good good information. Okay, so first question is why the two parts to quality. I mentioned this this morning, so just to kind of emphasize some things, you need to have a quality management system like ISO that says how well are things working for us, and several ways you weigh yourself on the scale and it tells you whether you're in or out. Uh, but if that's all you did is just weigh yourself and change nothing, you're not going to you know be in compliance. If your goal weight like my doctor has told me, I'm off the mark. So I, but I say I weigh myself every day, and he says, well, that's not even part of the equation. You got to start working on ways to improve that. So it might be a combination of better diet, or and or exercise. So you need both for quality to really work. And another way to look at it relative to ISO, you've got the quality management systems are the guardrails, and Lean Six Sigma are the steering control. So if all you're doing is putting in a QMS and you don't have ways to man maneuver, you're gonna find yourself in, in real trouble, all right? And then there's two basic quality tools. Lean, as I said this morning, focuses on going to the workshop, going to the Gamba, and it looks at waste you can see, and it's using you know physical observation with your eyes, and you're looking at what the variance from the standard is. So that's, that's Lean in a nutshell. On the other side, and why I believe they're complementary, is sometimes, you have to go beyond just what you can see, or maybe we're all remote, we can't actually go to the Gimba, but we have data. So you, you go to the data and you look for the variations that your customers feel. Um, so, you know, the old the joke we used to say with, with Six Sigma is if you put your one foot in cold water and the other one in hot water, it, you know, on average, you feel pretty nice, right? Well, the reality is those extremes are what your customers often feel. So you're looking at statistical inference to, to understand what drives that variation and look for ways to identify the, the major factor that you can, you can um, control so that you can reduce that variation. And you're looking at the variation from the mean, right? All right, so some examples of Lean Six Sigma. Um, here's a Lean in one picture. Has anyone ever done this? Anyone change a tire? Has anyone ever changed a tire? I always like to ask that question, conversely. Wow, okay. All right, so this may not mean anything to you then if you've never changed a tire, but this is typically 20 minutes. And um, there's a, uh, I think, um, is it Red Bull? I think they have a two minute video, it's two seconds, excuse me. And it's so fast, they have to show it in slow motion, but it's really cool. So Google it, I think it's Red Bull. Um, and uh, they break it down and, and you, you start to see how they've organized the process so that they can do a two second. Uh, they, they don't just change the tires, they also refuel. So they're doing more than this uh, young lady in the picture is. And so you're, you're looking at ways to eliminate waste and streamline and, and organize your workflow. Um, so in that case, this idea of the seven ways, we've added a, an, uh, an eighth item for not using talent. But let's talk about what could go wrong in changing a tire. Um, has anyone ever changed a tire than the tire was flat? I have. <laughs> How about, I, I, I stopped by once, one Christmas, young ladies were stranded and I said, I'll help you change your tire. Uh, Overproduction was having so much stuff, we couldn't even find the jack. I mean, it, we had to unload all their Christmas gear, 
just to find the uh, the spare. Um, waiting, those of you that have never changed a tire, have you, how long have you waited for the, the uh, AAA person to come? A long time, yeah. Hour, more, depending on what night, time of day. So that's that's a waste. Not using talent, uh, not being tr trained uh, properly for safety. So I have a CRV, and it's got uh, 100, no, it's got 20,000 miles on it. And I didn't think I needed to chalk it, but in Kentucky, we have hills. And so I jacked the thing up, and I saw the thing slowly <laughs> do this, and it crumbled the, uh, the jack, so I have to buy a new jack. But I wasn't thinking, I will not make that mistake again. I always chalk the tires, because they will move. So that's a waste, not using your talent. Transport is going back and forth to get your flat and your spare, maybe even going back to find the, the nuts that roll down the hill. Uh, inventory would be not having the right tools or having the right too much of the wrong things. Maybe you have a toolbox in your trunk, but it's not the one that goes with your tire. Um, going back and forth to, to get the tools, get the tire, that's excess motion. And extra processing, has anyone ever fixed something on the car and taken it to the dealer? That's extra processing, right? Because you did it and you had someone else do it. So this is waste. And can everyone agree that waste is fair game, right? This, this isn't someone's job. I know people get really nervous. They say lean is all about making lean and mean, all this kind of stuff. No, it's really about getting, it's really about speed, just like that, uh, the tire change with the, uh, the, the Indy Pit crew. There you go. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Excellent example. Absolutely. That's a bit. Yes. It usually, that's usually the way it works, right? Okay. So we talked about lean. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what is Six Sigma. And um, for our yellow belt, the way Six Sigma, it's, it's a philosophy, it's a, it's a collection of tools, um, it's a project management methodology, and the way it's organized typically, this is Dr. Michael Harry who co-created it, um, it's really good to have a white belt training for, if you're going to do a project like this, is everyone gets some basic level of training. And there's a, there's a, there's a website for, you can get free white belt training. SSMI offers it, I think it's 100 bucks, and it's not very di difficult. But that's really what you want to have your team members trained. Just so that when you start spouting out some of these tools and techniques, they're going, oh, that's what Pareto chart is. You don't want to alienate anybody and use a language that they're not familiar with. Uh, a project team member. So in your case, did it help you become a team member and understand what the team is going to do? Okay. Right. Especially also for inventory, it's like overproduction. Great, great. So I think it's good to have some level of training, and it doesn't have to be like two weeks training. What I don't know how long your training was, but it, it's important. To, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, but you want to get the whole team involved as a team member for the project, so it adds that level of project management um, that Dan and I were talking about pre before the, the presentation. Greenbelt would be your project team le leader, and there's typically a little bit of statistic, statistic in there, not a lot. And then the, the black belt or master black belt are trained not only in how to manage projects, but also how to coach green belts and to use more of the statistical tools. So that's, in a nutshell, sort of how um, it ratchets up. And the other difference is the time to get the certifications typically longer, uh, and if you're going to pay for training, it's typically more expensive because there's more stuff to it. So that's really what Six Sigma, how it really looks uh, in, in, in a lot of places. Uh, they all follow the same methodology. Uh, it's just an acronym for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And as you look at it, you're like, that's all it is? Yeah, that's all it is. So the first phase is define the problem. Then you want to measure the current state and don't try to fix it right there. A lot of companies do this. They want to fix it, and they haven't even figured out what really is going on. So you want to take a little further and look at the root causes and then brainstorm solutions using the, the sticky notes that we do. And then we talk about how do we monitor the process? How do we effectively hand the process over? So how many people have done process improvement projects? Okay. Your project, did it stick? It did not. Why? Uh, we changed vendors. You changed vendors. Okay. How about yours? Did your, did your solution stick? Yes. Okay. So how did it stick? Yep. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, no, that's the idea. So the key word is monitoring. So if you uh, leave it to chance, you're probably going to go back to what you had before. So that's really, again, the demand flow. There, there are a series of milestones of the project. And a lot of these, these flip charts are kind of uh, the way we've pulled our tools together. They follow yeah. that same that same workflow. So some of these um, flip charts are in the define phase. Some are more in the uh, measure, analyze, and the other ones toward the end, out the door, or your control phase kind of things. And while I'm thinking about it, when you lead a project like this, um, and you'll see this in the slide in a minute, is, is have these blank templates on your walls in the order in which you're going to do them, because that gives your your uh, your guests an idea or your team, hey, this is we're going to get out of here. This this is this is going to work for us. As opposed to we've got a spreadsheet template, and I used to do it with a spreadsheet. And when I'm on the computer, what happens? Everybody else starts whipping out their their <laughs> iPhone, right? So this is another technique to keep everybody engaged. So it seems simplistic, but it really works. Yes, sir. Not, no, yeah, you can use data all throughout, and that's where people get confused. Yeah, you're using data to, because if you just want to say you're baselining, you know, what's your what's your normal weight, right? Before you start work going on a diet, let's see what your current what's been your weight over the last 10 years. So you're not really doing anything but just measuring it right, as it currently is. Then you're finding out what are some things that are contributing to that. So you really can't do them. And that's a really good good question. So his question was, can you do these all at once? And I would maintain you don't. Because what often happens is you get a, a solution before you even really know if it's the right answer. Right? Yes, ma'am. So one thing we came up with using this recently is we defined the call question around time. Yep. For us for the we put it around time for CT scan. Okay. And we thought that it was predominantly the test and radiology. And only when we were trying to identify the cause, finding a whole set of causes contributing to that, leading from the uh, the lab, from ER, and so forth. So when you, my question to you is, when you start with defining the problem, which in this case is turnaround time, mm -hmm. and then as you're going through the different phases, recognizing uh, we need to break this problem into several subsections, what do you do then? Do you scratch that, and then you identify the picking the problem that's going to have the biggest return on the um, or the solution, I guess. How would you go about that? Right. So uh, with rapid cycle, and we'll talk about. I keep promising we're going to get there, and I promise we will. But um, the key to success for that is twofold. One is breaking up the Mac into smaller chunks. Number one, and then having senior C-suite champions that you're accountable to, and they help you with the scope. So what you just defined was, and this happens a lot, where we 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 think we're going to do turnaround time, and we said, well, it's actually this part of turnaround time. In that part, so you actually could use multi-vote to to decide which one you want to hit first, or maybe you say, well, let's do this sequentially. Let's let's hit the the first head of the process, get that nailed down, and then we can work on the next. There isn't a hard and fast rule, but I typically like to work on tools that either help to prioritize the biggest, where the where the pain's the greatest. And it might be another technique I've used is just looking at the turnaround time of each each section. So let's say your turnaround time was two hours and 90% of that time was right there. Well, it really makes sense to get that part worked out first, correct? So, does that make sense? The word causes is as well. Yes. Yes. And at where I thought you were going, and, I, and I'm, and so I, did I answer your question, number one? Okay. Another way that you can, um, and maybe it'll answer you, your question about can you do them, who, who said can we do them together? You did. Um, you can look at, Root causes, I know one way is to just do with that five whys, why this happened, well, because of this, because of that, because of that. That's a great technique. Another one is, is called, I call 6Ms. Have you ever used a 6M? It's it's manpower, and I don't, I'm being sexist here, it's just people power, it's, it's M. Manpower, methods, uh, machinery, methods, measurements, and another one we like to throw in, I call mother nature. And so you have those categories, and you, and you just brainstorm within those categories. And you'd be amazed at how many people say, like, for example, mother nature is, anything related to the environment, weather, humidity, that kind of thing. Measurements is another one that's interesting because how many people do something wrong because of the measurement, right? We focus on, you know, your door to blank is has to be this or your productivity has to be that, and what do you do? You short circuit, unless the process is, needs to be fixed. So that 6M process is another great 
tool in the toolkit that I've used to help us get off the dime because that's a great example because that's a very complicated process as you found out right yeah so how's it it's been around time was tied to the um, employee raises oh okay so only to recognize we could not fix turnaround time because there were so many other categories that need to be addressed before we can fix turnaround time so unfortunately they didn't get their raises as a result so okay you know, another thing you can use, uh, we call a four block, which is you take uh, an uh, X and Y axis. So I usually use impact and, and effort, okay? And you want, to, you want to do projects that have the greatest impact with the least amount of effort. But you can also use that same idea with things that you control versus things you don't control. So you can put control. Um, I did a project with the nursing staff uh, with Pitocin. We had a... a an adverse event nearly killed the patient and the baby because Pitocin, you can't see what it is, it's clear. And so we were coming up with, with ways to fix that and we, I used the effort and impact matrix and it went right over their heads and someone said, wait a minute, what's something, what can we control and what can we not? So we used that matrix and it really, the lights started going off about how to make that more preventable. Yeah, so the four blocks, another great tool. I love this interaction, by the way, at four in the afternoon before the big party. I love it. So here's an example of six, uh, of, of six Sigma. We always say, well, it's all about statistics. So I'm from Kentucky. So someone decided, they, they said, there's a hypothesis. It looks to me, what do you see with this chart here? So this is the marriage rate in Kentucky. It's been going down for uh, the last few years. And the other squirrely one is the uh, relationship of, of people dying in boating accidents. Kentuckians like to fish. So what would you conclude from this, this study? Don't get married if you're going to be in. No. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I put in parentheses. I am kidding. But six sigma starts with a hypothesis. Do fewer marriages lead to fewer uh, uh, drownings? And and no, that's that's not true. There's something else more impactful going on, right? And this is really the problem with, with some statisticians. They 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 take like they think this is the the root cause. It's not. It's just a funny way to show how you can use data. But here's a better way. Okay, I, I snagged this from someone's presentation. I'm not sure, but it was an MD Expo. Now, we're going to work on a project, and I'm going to use you an example if, when you're looking up. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, looking at this number, okay, which, where should we focus our efforts without spending too much time on it? Can you tell? Okay. Well, that looks like, yeah. How'd you find that? You went the total hours, right? You cheated. No, but no, the point is that sometimes um, our role in Six Sigma and our team is to take data looks a little, we can't see a pattern, and, you know, use another tool. Now, look at that. Can you tell what we should focus our efforts on? Yeah, so Pareto is that 80-20 rule. We found that 80% of our time is spent finding the missing devices, and then the next one is closing a PM. I heard that this morning in one of the other presentations about that time between uh, opening and closing a PM. There you go. So that's a so that's a potential solution that we would get to at some point. There's there's you know relative to other ideas. Yeah. So again, Pareto is a great tool. Uh, it's probably one of my power tools because I find this a lot. We we are full of data, right? We we get reports and we but we don't do anything. Do you all send reports and don't act on them? We do. <laughs> Part of my job is sending reports to the Environment and Care Committee, and no one does anything. And I, and I told my wife, I said, I want to use a data like this. And he said, don't. <laughs> he got a little scared, but we will. We're going to start using data and, and presenting it in ways where people take action. So Lean Six Sigma combines speed with rigor. And that's why I like putting the two together. Uh, lean activities, who's done 5S work? I think you were talking about, it. yeah. You get almost immediate results, don't you, right? Uh, they're not bucks, not big bucks. So if you're trying to justify 5s and get return on your investment, you're not going to probably not going to get there. Um, so anyway, uh, best of the best, and even with that, 100% of all successes had a good technical solution. Does this make sense? It's a good solution, right? 98% of all those unsuccessful chasing, uh, unsuccessful changes also had a good technical solution, right? So what's wrong with that picture? To make you think a little bit. Now, I know you all have done projects that look successful short term, but long term maybe didn't, right? So why did things fail? Um, this is that as a PhD I used to work with. He was an uh, industrial engineer PhD, 
And uh, I called him website because anytime I asked Bill a simple question, it was an hour and a half dissertation. But together we argued about why things don't work. And uh, he, he said, well, it's got to be a good technical solution, yes. And you got to get the culture side of it. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. But there's something else missing. And so it's got to be effective. It has to be accepted. And, and there has to be rigor around how you came up with the answer. So when you're talking your solution to the, the missing devices, yeah, we could put a bounty on them. But you did it without much rigor, right? You just said, oh, that's the that solution. So you have to use some rigor around that. But first thing, it's got to be effective, evidence-based. You proved that it worked. And you listen to the voice of all your stakeholders. So we work in a crazy environment. We have many masters, right? We have, who are our masters? Who, do we, who are we accountable to in, in our world? Are we, spouse. Our, our spouse, okay. At a, at a, at a, <laughs> but at the hospital, in HTM. Nurses, yeah. Finance, yeah. Administrative, yeah. How about our managers? How about our staff? Yeah, I mean, have you all put in something that was not popular? So we were always asking, first of all, does it work and you can improve it? Um, and the next one is, is there buy-in? So uh, I have, all my kids are what I call millennials and they won't do anything unless they understand why we're doing it. It drives me nuts. When I was a kid, do it, because I said so. That was my parents' line. So now we have to, you know, here's why we're doing it and then get on board with it. Um, have you all had process or problems with leadership uh, sponsoring something, buy-in? Do leaders say do it and they, they step back and say, that was my idea. Happened in my life. So leadership, sponsorship is key, and how it aligns with your vision, mission, and values is key for, for that buy-in to happen. And the rigor, you know, can't overstate this enough. Having a communication plan, an education plan, standard work instructions, and ways to measure success, short-term and long-term, and how you're going to audit it, and make it easy to do the right thing. That's probably the most important thing about a rigor in the ear model is making sure that it's easier to do the right thing than to work around it. Okay. So, and that's how you make it sustaining. So you're using Lean Six Sigma tools to, to get to the right answer the right way and then using some of those control mechanisms in place that you, you talked about. It's hard to point at you, but that was a great suggestion. So that is self-sustaining. That's really the ultimate goal. And that's the ear model. All right, so everyone pumped about doing our first change project? Yes. All right, uh, barriers. So th these are the, for those of you that have never seen this, <laughs> this is called a slinky and uh, it lasts works for about five minutes before the thing gets tangled up. But that first moment when you get it down the stairs and it does it again, so you're overcoming, you're putting some force into it to overcome inertia. But there's a lot of other challenges to, over, to overcome inertia. So no time to participate, takes too long to do a Lean Six Sigma project. It's just short-term gain, no financial gain. Too many statistical tools, you, you confuse me with all this Lean Six Sigma stuff, too complicated, and uh, no one really, really wants to do this. So those are just a, that's a starter list. You all could probably talk for an hour about, you know, things that you, you need to overcome when you're trying to break free from inertia. But those are the big ones. And so when we talk about the Six Sigma tools, so remember I was talking about that four block? I was looking at uh, impact, low to high, and then speed, low to high. And so Kanban, 5S, Six Sigma has very high impact, but it takes more time typically to get the answer, six months to a year sometimes. Eight ways, team skills, very, you can get that going right away, but the impact may be kind of low. So what's, the, how do we pull all this together? Well, I'm glad you asked. So we're, we're going to talk about rapid cycle. So we, we took the, the DMAIC process and chunked it into, into logical chunks because uh, when you're asking for help from the nursing staff, from supply chain, people outside your department, you have to sell it. Well, you know, we're going to do this over three months and we're gonna have three two hour sessions, working sessions. We'll have the flip charts already on the walls and all we're gonna do is it's like it's like paint by numbers. We fill it out as we go. And usually the managers go, okay, I got nothing else to, I got nothing to lose, so let's give it a whirl. So we've been really successful in taking the Demaic approach and breaking it down and giving some time between sessions. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So that really does um, bring the best of everything. So it combines all those eight ways, Six Sigma, 5S combine and so forth. All right, so the difference with rapid cycle is prep is at both ends. So on the front end, we spend a lot of time getting leadership commitment, making sure they're on board with it, and they can tell the respective staffs do it. Uh, they help us with the scope. So when you were talking about you know your project, probably it's too large a scope, right? And so when we're doing this process, we occasionally 
take the time and feedback to the leaders and say, uh, we've discovered something. We think we'll, well, it's better if we can break this part down. And they go, yeah, I agree, and move on, okay? And then the other things, you know, we, we do the voice of business, which you see that slide there. So that's at the first session. We baseline with numbers if we can, or maybe we just walk the shop and take pictures. When I've done 5S, a picture says a thousand words. I love doing that. It's almost embarrassing, but people get motivated when they see their shop and the way that it looks. So that's part of the fine process. You know, measuring the current state with data if you have it, uh, confirming the scope. Again, we start with initial scope, but maybe along the way we might say, yeah, we this is too big to be done in, in a short period of time. Um, getting to the root causes, working toward the launch plan, all that. This stuff is this is boring because who wants to? Well, I've got to say who's going to do it, when are they going to do it, and how we're going to communicate. But you have to do that. And then the control part is obviously measuring the results, verifying that it was better, and then coming up with some implementation tools that sustain it so you can walk away. So when I've been asked to do rapid cycles, I, I make sure that we're all clear about what we're about to embark on because we're going to celebrate and we're going to validate long-term gains and then we're going to either, we're going to disband because we, we did it in one hospital and we're done, or we might actually replicate it and, and take this idea to, to other hospitals. So that's that's the that's the guts, okay? There's the my little fancy graphics. I learned this new tool, so I'm like, I'm going to, show, I'm going to use them. Okay, all right. So really what we've done is we've taken, uh, if you think about touch time, see the, the yellow, orange, and red? That's just a two-hour session. We bring our, all our team in, we feed them lunch. That's also a, a night, if you, if you haven't figured that out, offer lunch, I'll work for food. So people will typically come in for a, a long lunch because they have to eat anyway, and it's kind of communal and all that kind of good stuff. And then they leave, go back, and they, they do their day job stuff. So the, the blue arrows are kind of what happens outside the meeting. And that's really important because you're doing all that stuff to test its effectiveness. You're doing, you're, you're making sure that everyone's on board with it, uh, looking for any barriers, that kind of thing. So the outside the meetings are just as important. And then that last part's the handoff, okay? So it, it, it combines the two E's I like to talk about, effective. In other words, the bulk of the activity is done outside the meeting. And they, it's efficient because we're, we're getting stuff done. I mean, the meetings are really high powered. There's not a lot of opportunity for people to digress. I think it takes a while for them to learn that, but they do, and then they start, there's some shortcuts I'll share with you, how to make your team meetings more effective and make this work for you. And so we, yeah, typically we like to say three months max. And and that's that's what's key, and I'm glad you shared if that's your challenge about making sure the scope is legitimate for you know this kind of process. Oh. We didn't have enough lead time to really delve into what are all the contributing factors, the five whys of what is contributing to turnaround time. Mm -hmm. Turnaround time seems to be an issue with us, and we want to fix it. Today. Yeah, you know, you really could almost do a, a project like this, and the output is to determine what we're going to do, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's that's a that would be a good use of this this process. Okay, so I'm going to dive a little bit more in more, in more detail about rap, the rapid cycle using a case study. I touched on this morning, but I didn't give all this. It's kind of like that guy yesterday was doing the juggling. If he showed us how he did it, I don't think he was going to show us how he did it. You know, his secret is still a secret. But the bottom line, this is what we had um, in, the, in the current state. And here were the, the key uh, C-suite leaders who all came to me in, in different emails and other methods said, fix this. So supply chain says... My guys are wasting too much time looking for accessories. Fix it. The chief nursing officer said, my nurse managers, I like how they personally, they're white people. Nurse managers are spending too much time ordering these stupid accessories. That's, a, that's something you should do. I'm, I'm, like, I'm not sure that makes sense, but oh, oh, okay. And then last two words, fix it. Okay. System director, my former boss said, you know what, our, our data says, we're, our techs are spending too much time wasting time looking for no defects found. They put these monitors in, they check them, and boom, it's working fine. So we're wasting so much time on that. So you have three very high-powered uh, different organizations all wanting the same thing, to fix the patient uh, monitor accessories problem, okay? Um, and at the next level down, so at the front lines, the stress staff, so you have these CNAs who are, you know, all they want is to have a monitor ready to go to, to, to care for the patient. Um, the problem with the cur current state was that the uh, nurse managers had they had their own supplies of accessories, and when they left after five or six or whatever, they were gone. And I actually was there one night and saw 
the, C, the, the CNA knocking on the door and her, and her shoulders slumped down because she knew that she wasn't going to get the accessories she needed. So what did she do? She robbed it from another device. <laughs> she went on her merry way. Now, I don't know. She probably fixed it one way, but it, she looked very dis despondent. Uh, you know, they asked us to help because uh, one of the good and bad things about being ISO, now it's, it's like you're held to a higher standard. So the CNO knew that we were ISO certified. And she said, you're so good, you should help us fix this because we're your customer. And that's kind of like the ultimate Trump, okay, I'll do it. Uh, we, we didn't have to. At first I said, hey, this is, out, this is outside, our, this is them. But, but as part of the continuous improvement, quality improvement, customer improvement, we said, okay, we'll, we'll walk through this process and, and see if we can, it can't be any worse. It, it's, it could look like that and it wouldn't be any worse than that. Um, supply chain, you know, they realized that the, the nurses were stashing away almost three quarter million dollars of these things all across the system and we couldn't find them. Um, this is a peak of the, of the future state, uh, what we replaced it with and I'll walk you through more details. That solution didn't come at once. It took several iterations and a lot of, uh, um, how can I say, difficult behavior team dynamics wise to get there. And these are just some of the tools that we used. Again, I didn't do any formal training, but when you step back and say, these are the things that we did. We looked at bottlenecks. So we're, how do you know where's a bottleneck? What, what's a clue? There's usually piles of something in front of it, okay? So there were um, the accessories when we went to the different areas all throughout the hospital system. It was kind of like when my mother-in-law would, would drop in unannounced and I'd be you know, putting the dishes away or what have you. That's exactly what they were doing. I'd, we'd come in their office and they're putting away accessories. They were embarrassed. So we saw bottlenecks there. Um, a Kanban is just a signal. How do you replenish and how do you uh, signal to buy more? Uh, getting to one piece flow is important to that. Standard work instructions, goof proof. Golden sample, I'll talk about that in a second. We use the voice of customer. Has anyone not been exposed to voice of customer? What that really means? You have not? Okay, so um, voice of customer is really the, um, I call them must haves. So if you're gonna do an improvement project, you wanna ask your customer, and sometimes we're the customer too, by the way. So these are the must-haves for our solution. So we might have a great solution, like you said, but does it satisfy their needs, all right? Um, voice of business is different because that could be the constraints. So a typical voice of business uh, must-have is can't add headcount, okay? So it's gotta be effective, easy to do, cheaper, whatever, faster, but we can't add headcount, okay? So that'd be a voice of business kind of um, must have, all right? So that's something we used. We used a SIPOC, as you can see there. We did some process mapping. We did five whys. Uh, we did the Pareto analysis, which helped. And then we, to our solution, came up with using visual management um, to get to our solution. And then we used, this actually started the whole process uh, rolling. So a Kappa is an ISO tool that we just embraced. And it's, it's corrective and preventative actions. The thing I really like about it, I didn't like it at first because I thought it was yet another form we had to fill out for ISO. But the way it works is you, you identify either an opportunity or uh, an, an issue and you, you, you rate its severity and then you say, I'm gonna assign it to someone to investigate it. It's the ultimate pass the buck tool. So you, you take off and you look at what the root causes were and you say, here's what I found. And then maybe you came up with some short-term solutions. Well, we, we'll do this just to get us over the hump but we're not out of the woods yet because we have to come up with a long-term solution that's gonna work better. And then where I come in is I sign off on every single cap. I have to go back and say, well, let me see what you've done. And if it looks like it's not, it's not working, I'll say, I'm not gonna sign off on this. So there is that ultimate uh, veto authority, which I really like, uh, is part of Kappa. So it breaks, the, breaks down the problem-solving uh, announcement very nicely. All right, so here's what we did with the process. You've got your plan to cycle there. Uh, we baseline the process. We went to every floor and a uh, technique we use to establish how much you uh, agree with something is called fist to five. Who, who were in my earlier session? What fist to five is? Okay, they know. Okay, uh, fist. Okay, I'll give you an example. So fist is it's a way of get, of understanding consensus. So whenever you have a vote, there's someone that won and someone that loses, right? And that's not good when you're trying to get a, a solution in 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 place. So Consensus means I might not agree whole, wholeheartedly, but I'll support it. So a fist means I'm not in the boat, I don't agree. One means I'm in the boat, I'm not paddling. Five means I really like this. So fist to five, that's how you use that. So let's try this with this group. This, so fist to five, we're gonna have 
pizza on the on the on the grill, uh, pizza at the, at the party. Excuse me. I just want to say, you do it all at once. A fist of five, we're having pepperoni pizza. I want to see everyone's hands. So we got some twos, some fives, a, a one. Okay. Any anyone not on board with it? Come on. We have some ve vegans. Okay. Here's my token vegan. No, I'm just making fun. So so what was what's your problem with it? I'm vegan. You're no. vegan. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> Carbs, okay. So a way to use that. This is a really powerful tool because uh, in this project, we did have a moment where the key C-suite leader did this. <laughs> and it totally derailed. It, it, it derailed, well, we could have derailed it, but I had the presence of mind to excuse everybody else out of the room and said, we need to talk about what to, what is it going to take to get you in the boat. So it's exactly what you do. So I'm going to say, Dan, what would it take to get you in the boat for our meal? Replace the carbohydrates with something else. Okay, so we, we have a non-carb offering. And Maybe pizza. An all meat, on all, there you go, an all, all meat, okay, all meat pizza with cauliflower crust. There you go. So now, and then once you've done that, okay, fist five. Now he's a five. And the way you do that is it's kind of neat because I want to know why you, who was our five? Al was our five. He loves pepperoni pizza, I think, right? And we had a couple ones and twos, right? So you're, why were you two? I mean, we're three kids, so we always have. So, so, so you, yeah. okay, all right, you'll, yeah, you're not, you're like, okay, pizza, pizza again, I gotcha, gotcha, yeah, yeah, make it special, and just, so do you see how that works? I mean, uh, if you get nothing else out of the day, if you, if you take back, in fact, it's so, in, so powerful that in meetings now, it, it short circuits the endless arguing, I, I've seen my team do this, they'll go, <laughs> or they'll do that, and it's interesting, which sort of shorts it, right? It's okay to have differences, right? And I'll ask what, you know, but if I have someone that's like this, how, why is it important to get Dan on, on board? We, we go off and do our merry thing. Is he going to support it? No, he might even sabotage it. So it's better to know that now, you know, and, and our ones. So if I said, you know what, we're, we're budget constrained. I got a two for one at Domino's. It's going to be pepperoni. I mean, you're still on board, right? You're not going to like it. Yeah, right? You see how that works? Okay, so that's what we did. We actually said, okay, on a scale of zero to five, how, how well is the current process? And it's interesting, we asked the managers, guess what they said? Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, and, and he's the guy that has to restock them. He says, this thing stinks, right? He was not shy. So that was the baseline. It wasn't statistical data, it was qualitative, but it was helpful for us to understand the process. And uh, so we did a rapid cycle and you can see the, the uh, evidence of that. And then we looked at gaining buy-in through the, through the process. And then we piloted a solution. And a pilot solution is important because it allows you, it's not to say we're not going to do it. It's to say we're going to find, if it doesn't, we're going to find ways to fix it. Okay? So that's really a nutshell how we get from defining the problem all the way to coming up with a solution and ultimately launching the project. All right. So I'm just going to kind of give you, how are we doing on time? Love. 10 minutes. Oh, this is going to be a rapid cycle, rapid cycle. How about that? So we're going to go through this fast. All right, this is Katya, and you can see how she arranged. See how she did that? She put the, the flip charts so that and there's only one way out. So it was kind of nice the way she did that. She had uh, data packets prepared ahead of time, post-it notes, cards, and markers. Everyone had their own personal one. And they didn't know what to do at first. They were like, no one's ever asked me what I thought. So this is really a nice way to do this. Um, I talked a little bit about the, what I call the power tools of improvement. Brainstorming, you know, as you can see here, we use the stickies. My boss thinks I own stock in 3M, I do not, but it's a really powerful tool. And again, combine that with multi-voting so that you can figure out what is the most important or impactful one you want to work on. Using that consensus tool and then using a four block. And you can, you can put impact low and high and uh, effort low and high, and, and it's very qualitative. So, you, you know, you have your sticky and you say, okay, we're going to do this. Is this, this going to have a high or low impact? And, you know, it's binary, one or two. So you stick it up here and they say, is it going to take a long time to do it or, or we can do it tomorrow? And they'll, they'll tell you where to put it, where to put the sticky note, okay? Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so that, that's, the, that's the big, what I call the big three. Um, another one is if you're going to do something like this, and this is pretty major impact, right? Um, we, we established some running rules, and the first one was that everyone participates, and we have respect for everyone, so we use that fist to five to keep everyone in the boat, and then we want to be action-focused. So we use these tools so that we don't talk about it, and, you know, in aught six, you know, when we drove around in 10 Lizzie's, this is what the problem was. We sort of say, okay, fist to five, we're ready to move on. 
use that technique to get the the over talker to get off the stove box. So I would say use those rapid cycle rules too. All right, um, this is just a, again, if you all want this this format, send me an email to mcook26 at gmail, and I've got my address at the end. I'd be happy to give you the template, but you want to have uh, a, a good agenda at the end. So the, the sponsors were there on, on Zoom. They thanked us for doing this in advance, and then they, came, they let us do our work, and they came back at the end. So at the end of two hours, they expect you to get through this, okay? It motivates you very much when a C-suite says, we'll come back and help people, you'll have it done. Um, we had a project overview, I won't read all that, but it's important to talk about, you know, what the scope definition, what's your outcome, desired outcome, who are the sponsors, and all that kind of stuff. So you want to you wanna have that on there. We started initially to give some data, so what, what can you see from this very simplistic chart? Uh, these are the acronyms for our hospitals, so Norton Audubon Hospital and Norton Downtown make up two-thirds of the expenses on accessories. So now that you know that, would you spend any time here or here? No, you spent, You want to get the biggest bang for your buck. And so we decided to launch our project at Norton Downtown. Again, using some of the data and, and formatting in a way so that you can see right away what's going on. Uh, you'll appreciate this. So in your world, what's, what will be the top two or the top supplier of maintenance? What, what supplier are you, are you have, the, have the most maintenance calls? I'm just kind of curious for you. Give me a name of it. Phillips, GE, what? Who? Canon, okay. Any others? Well, we did this, so we, we went in our CMS and pulled the data out. Interesting enough, look at that mountaintop. That's what you want to see in a Pareto, by the way. You want to see something that sticks out higher than anybody else, right? So Phillips Medical turned out to be the number one uh, by a number of uh, uh, repairs, uh, quite a bit, more than anybody else. So we did a deeper dive and said, I wonder what's driving that. So check this out. <laughs> Accessories. So, so does this help us to do this project, even though we didn't want to? Of course it does. Look at that. A thousand, this is over this, you know, some period of time, you know, and then it also the no problem found, and we, do, and we read the actual documentation, they'd say, check the accessories, no problem. So we knew that we were on the right track. Operator, yeah, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so, you, you know, that's, we gave a little bit of data just to get people going. Are we, are we moving in the right direction? Uh, we we kind of recaptured a, a scope statement, so this is an important talk about just flat out in one sentence what's going on, any exclusions, because sometimes people assume we're going to solve world hunger or whatever, baldness, and we're not. We're going to constrain it to something else, and then some assumptions about what are, when we say these things, what are we saying here? So this scope statement is another uh, good tool to have in your in your deck. And you see how the DMAC, we've we've got that in there so you can kind of see where in the process we are. We walked the process, and what we discovered that everyone does this their own way. So no wonder we spent $700,000 for these things, and they were lost, damaged, couldn't find. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were clear about what are we trying to solve here. So it's important we said these are the things, whatever solutions we come up with have to work with these devices. Uh, you'd be amazed how quickly you, you can get off, off target with this kind of stuff. Uh, we did the, the downtime. So there was lots of issues, but you can see Staff getting the wrong accessory, overproduction. I won't read all those for you in the uh, interest of time. Totally a mess, yes. And this was the best one, not using a talent. Supply chain really wasn't involved at all. If my, my former boss wasn't assistant VP um, of supply chain, I'm not sure we would have gotten the support, but I, I called in a favor, you know, that phone a friend kind of thing. So we got them on, bo on, uh, on board. Okay, these are my fancy graphics here. All right, so. As I said earlier, the voice of business is just making sure that what does success look like for all our stakeholders? Stakeholders could be internal, external customers, and so on. Uh, what kind of barriers did, did we have? And you can see the number, number one barrier, even if you can't see the flip charts, storage space. So whatever solution we came up with had to solve that problem, right? Uh, we use our SIPOC to make sure that nobody was excluded, and we, we were pretty good. We had all the right people on board. Um, so at the end of the set, first session, we kind of made sure our scope was clear. We made sure that our sponsors were involved because they would we'd have to phone a friend later with them to keep things moving, and we we're getting ready for the next one. All right, rapid cycle two. Um, here's where the team dynamics start to emerge, and and the gentleman in the front was he emerged as our project leader. 
I think he, he the passion was there. He 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 got with it. You know, you're in a class when someone's like you can tell that they're on board with it. Well, that was Frank. He he was really a, a tremendous uh, uh, leader that sort of bubbled up in the process. Um, we came back and, and added more data because we were kind of curious about uh, what's going on here. So my intern made a really isn't that a nice Pareto chart? Can you tell what the biggest problem is? Which col what color is it? <laughs> It's this one, right? This is a crazy one because this one, uh, what we would do is we'd order the the uh, hose and we'd order the fitting, and then you'd have to put a work order to snip the hose and put a, a, a Welsh Allen fitting. Does anybody else do that stupidity? Well, yes, don't do that. <laughs> okay. So here's, but, but you know, you come up measurements. This is what was driving the behavior. No one really thought that, that there was any cost to do that. But I took a time study. I said, well, how much time does a nurse manager take to order those parts and then you got to put in the work ticket and then you got to ship it over to our department and they have to put it together and then ship it back to the nurse it turns out to be about forty dollars per accessory okay now is that real cost no I mean they're gonna I'm not gonna pull them out of the workforce but just to give you an idea of what waste there was uh, for the the, the in-house make versus buy so the the question was why the retrofit WTF Okay, uh, we did a, a generic process map, which looks great. I call this the happy path, right? It flows only one way, but the reality was, this is our process map, and we had seven different ways to get there. <laughs> so and that's a real problem, right? Um, so what we did is we said, well, let's look at the fundamental process steps, and that's what's uh, over here. And then we asked, okay, who could do this? So we'd say, for example, I need to communicate, I need a new part, who could do it? Well. The PCA in the, R, the, uh, the, the RN. Could anybody else do that? No. How about getting the, the accessories? Turns out, could I go get it? Yeah. Could, could our CE folks, clinical engineering? Yeah, they can go. The 80, everyone can do it. You see that? Now, why did we do that? Okay. We did that because we wanted to open people's mind beyond their department, right? That's a very important thing because um, what we ended up found out is that the best people to to pull from stock, order the accessories, put it back into loss in our, our tracking system, put it back in the system and so forth, turned out to be supply chain who weren't even involved in this. Okay, do you see how that works? Now, it sounds a little bit like we pushed the work out to somebody else, and that's exactly how the director took it. So when we did Fist of Five, guess what he said? <laughs> he sure did. And we were already well, we'd already, you know, done all our, uh, mapping and prior to that, you know, we we were we said this is this is a great idea because we said that makes more sense for them to do it. The problem is that he said, I can I need to add more staff. And uh, also the nurses focusing on the patient. Does she really need to spend time looking for accessories when there's a patient that needs attention? Beautiful. Okay, so you just wrote the script for me. So uh, I said, okay. Uh, I won't say his name, but Mr. Mr. B, uh, what would it take to get you in the boat? He says, well, I got to get some one of those senior sponsors to, to say yes. So we took it to the CNO, who was the one asking for this. She was the one that was red faced about this whole thing. She said exactly that. I said, I said, well, uh, we need we need your help. We we want to uh, upgrade someone's salary so they can take on the roles and audit. And she before I even said finish my you know, no period she said yes what and then she said what are you doing here so that was the ultimate yes so 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 that's saw mr b go hmm, okay that's all it took turns out as we ran this for a long time he thought it was going to take a lot of staff it turns out that this is a four hour per month job four hours a month in fact he is so on board that when we're replicating it he we were trying to do it with another nursing group and they were they were not on board they said well we want to control this and he said well wait a minute we we do all the reporting, and oh by the way, the 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 solution requires the, the nurse to scan in with a badge with the ID, and you probably didn't know this, but there's a camera over their head, so we we can control this. Don't worry, and that, and that's how they they're going to board with it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the solution matrix unless you want me to. No, you don't want me to. So the equipment became just as important as the drug distribution. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Good way to look at it. Yes. Um, the, Solution matrix is just a, another way to go from how do you prioritize, and it's it's a kind of mechanical way. But basically, remember all the VOB, VOC stuff? We, we rated how important it was, and then we said how well is the current process? N means it doesn't meet the need, and S means it meets it. And so we're comparing our solutions relative to the current state. So if we say, for example, it's got to be cost neutral, 
it's a, if it's the same as, as the other one, it's a zero. If it's worse than, it's a minus one. If it's better than, it's a plus one. And you, you add up all the scores of these, these uh, numbers, and you get a, a total score. So the solution we came up with, I don't think I actually did, articulated it, was solution three. I'm sorry, solution two. And it has a score of 23. The current state had a minus 26. So we went from minus 26 to plus 23. It's kind of an arbitrary way to do it, but some people like to see a number. I do, being a geeky engineer. So that's that's that process. All right. All right. Oh yeah. So we did the recommendation. We we you know we're in the meeting and we've already did our communication plan. We talked about how we're going to train the staff, and then. Uh, he was in the meeting and he did the fit. He did that. I said, okay, I sense that you're not on board with this. <laughs> uh, and he wasn't. But we found a way to get there, not even adding a head, but changing the, the staffing, uh, that person's um, uh, management level was all we needed to do. So the session three, work through this real quick. Um, create an implementation plan, who's going to do it, when, all that kind of stuff. Uh, communication plan, how are you going to communicate it? Like, is it morning huddles, emails? Whatever, whatever kinds of methods, face-to-face, -face, we've got that on that sheet out the back there. And then we talk about the implementation plan, how we're going to do it, who does it, when's it going to be completed. And then uh, that's the communication plan. So this is a solution we came up with. I don't know if I got more details, but it goes up like this. The, the current state, or the, the past state rather, was that, that you go to our website and you order it. Requires a lot of monitoring, right? They wanted, then the nurses started doing it. And then they wanted us to do it. And then we said, no, we want supply chain to do it. And that wasn't any good either. And they said, well, want to make it so it's like a kiosk. You know, you, you badge it, you pull it out, and off you go. And so that was the ultimate solution. And if this thing's locked up, probably did. Oh, can you hit the down button or see if it'll advance? Oh, there, I got control again. Yay. All right. So this is the risk model that we found from our ISO journey, but we also applied it to how effective is your solution so that the gentleman's talking about how do you control the process. You want to make it auto control if you can. So this is the idea. So we have a, in, on the fifth floor, instead of 17 locations, we have one location and we call it the supermarket. And every day or every, now it's just once a week because they've got it working so well. I don't think it's even once a week. Uh, the the auditor comes through and she has her little clipboard and she she looks at each of these bins and you see the look you probably can't see it yet this little green um, zip tie on it okay that's a visual management clue that says as long as there's a tie on it don't touch it if this tie is broken then she replaces up to the par level this is low tech no tech and then they have in the same hospital their own what I call the warehouse which is not just the nurses parts but they have other things that they manage locally. And they have a central supply, but this is their, their handy station I call the warehouse. So real simple. And it's, so that's the, that's the process. They replenish it, reset it, and then they audit, and it sort of follows its cycle. Look, so everybody wins. I'll kind of zoom in on this. So the, the biggest payoff was improved stocking levels. You know, we've, we've significantly reduced the number of parts that we have in the system. But the biggest problem we found was everyone speaks a different language. So nurses, they call this saying something, something, something. Um, the supplier, they call it a five-lead ECG truck cable, blah, 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 right? Um, supply chain says it's a 5JG. I think that's the loss of number. And then Mark Cooks, he would say, well, it's that round thingy with the funny ends. And so they put the golden sample inside, and they actually, it's taped in there, and they had to break it because, or cut it because some desperate nurse grabbed the golden sample, and we, we lost our visibility, but so you've got multiple levels of communication, and this is a secret sauce. So that is really cool, and that was I don't know who came up with that, but we were we were really overthinking this, and I guess they said, well, you know, we have a crash cart, right. exactly. So it was one of the nurses that said, why don't you just make it like a crash cart, and we put the zip ties on it, and we were like blinking at each other, and that and we're like, what? That's absolutely brilliant. So that's that's the current state. Okay, let's see how we did here. Um, I won't watch the video. This is like 10 seconds and 10 seconds with the video might be a little, little wonky, but it's it's so simple. Just me describing it is, is sufficient. So 5S is visual management features, a zip tie, signals replenishment, the golden sample, make sure you pick the right part, which is a big problem. The 5JG level is the, the warehouse stock location. The Phillips labels there as well. Um, 
And so now you've got there's there's you've reduced all those those problems with, with communication. And of course, the badge reader plus the camera really does help control the what we were concerned about with with over usage. Um, so here we are. We launched this in uh, November of last year. In January, we replicated it, and now we've just talked to the other hospitals and say, hey, this is such a great process. We think you need to look at it. So we're looking at the other three hospitals as well. All right, keys to success. Get that sponsorship commitment. Um, I love what you said about make sure you're clear about the scope and be prepared to change it. It's okay. Um, get a buddy. Uh, me having this young lady, uh, Katya, was was great. Uh, she helped me manage dysfunctional behaviors because she has a curious way of saying things. So if she doesn't agree with you, she'll say, I'm just curious. And she would say that to me quite a bit. So having someone like that, it, it, you know, you're dealing with people's you know, uh, feelings, so you want to be able to manage that. We've broken down the demand process into multiple two-hour sessions and um, you know, fill, make it a fill-in-the-blank process. Having the, po the post-it notes, the data packets, it made everyone feel special and it kept us on, uh, on track. And then teach the tools as you use them. So I did the Fist to Five on the first one. And then we talked about how we're going to do the, the multi-vote and that kind of thing. So it wasn't really a lot of training involved, just kind of on-the-job training. And again, don't forget to use those soft skills, okay? Can't say that enough. And <laughs> make sure you've got the follow-up, the 30, 60, 90 days, whatever time frame works for you. But make it long enough that, that uh, the temptation to go back to normal, you know, and that is normal. So, so that picture you, I showed you was just taken a few weeks ago. And we've been in place since January. So they've they've adopted it. It's self-sustaining. All right. Kind of in summary here, you want to increase, remember their first exercise, our car winner? You want to increase value, right? Uh, we want to improve cost, quality, safety, and service. Uh, we can speed that along with some of these techniques I'll help you seen today. Remember the ear model. Use a rapid cycle where it makes sense. And I'll just say some strategies here. Remember your customer demands quality. Uh, use um, investigate approaches of Lean Six Sigma. I would highly recommend if you want to talk to me offline about it or, or shoot me an email, I'd be happy to tell you more about the tools. Uh, plan for success. Uh, again, I saw talked about the ear model again, and then use the rapid cycle to speed solutions. This isn't going to solve all your problems. You, you know, there's a little bit of judgment. Is is this this felt like the right kind of project for this? Um, but use it where it makes sense. And that is it. And there's my contact information. Feel free to shoot me a note. Uh, do fill out the reviews. Let me know. If you can, give me some real comments because I know I sped through this. There was a lot of material to cover, and it, but I didn't want to, to ignore your comments and questions because that really makes it more personal to me. So uh, I appreciate you all hanging with us a few more, few more minutes. All right?